I've got a question for all of you Lutherans out there. How many sacraments are there? How many sacraments are there? Moment to answer. All right, time's up. How many sacraments are there? Did you say one sacrament, two sacraments, three, seven sacraments? If you said seven sacraments, you might be a Roman Catholic. If you said two or three sacraments, you are correct according to the Book of Concord. Now, it depends on where you look in the Book of Concord, but the Book of Concord counts, the Lutherans count either two or three sacraments. Now, this begs the question, what is a sacrament? I mean, how can you know how many sacraments we have unless you know what it is in the first place? The difficulty behind the term sacrament, you know, a holy thing, a sacred thing, the difficulty behind the difficulty behind this term of a sacrament is this isn't this isn't a word in the Bible. You don't have, you know, Jesus says, and then I give to you this second sacrament, and and, and if you're keeping track, this is the third sacrament. That's not what happens. The closest word that we have in the Bible to sacrament is mysterium, the mysteries. Now, the Eastern Orthodox are all stroking their beards and petting their bears and jumping up and down in joy because I mentioned mysteries. But that's the closest that the Bible comes to kind of defining what exactly is a sacrament or giving a, a, a definitive list of what is a sacrament. Now, depending on the definition, you'll get different numbers. And it's, it's really a silly thing to, to argue about. Say, oh, there's seven sacraments. Yeah, we want to include marriage as a sacrament because marriage is instituted by God and it's a blessing for people. Well, okay, if your definition for sacrament is something instituted by God and is a blessing for the people involved, then yeah, marriage is absolutely a sacrament. Um, the way the Lutherans would, would define it historically is a lot of times they would say, well, a sacrament is something that's instituted by God, contains the word of God, contains the promise of God, and then this last one is a little sometimes yes, sometimes no, contains a physical element. So the strictly speaking, the only two that would fit that category would be would be the Lord's Supper and would be baptism. And, and, and the blood the specifically the promise is the forgiveness of sins. I have to clarify that. Specifically the promise is the forgiveness of sins because again you have things like extreme unction and you know the thing of you know anointing the brothers who are sick and that has you know that has promises of blessing and stuff. But promises of forgiveness of sins. So forgiveness of sins instituted by God contains the word of God, contains a physical element. These things must be present according to Lutherans in order for us to consider a a sacrament. A sacrament. So Lord's Supper, baptism. Both have physical elements. But what about confession and absolution? Do you count sound waves as physical as physical elements? Do you count the, the, the pastor pronouncing the forgiveness of your sins as a physical element? I mean, you could make an argument about that. But this is, this is the distinction where this is a specific thing instituted by God for the forgiveness of sins. It includes the words of God. Now, a lot of Lutherans will hear about confession and absolution, and they'll say, "Wait, wait a minute! Isn't that that? Isn't that the Roman Catholic thing? Like, wh why we don't do that? That's you know, you set yourself up in a box and say, Father, you know, forgive me, uh, I, uh, for I have sinned. It's been 642 days since my last confession, etc. And I've seen it in the movies, and that's what the Roman Catholics do. The question I have, I mean, it's it's, it's not true." It's not just the Roman Catholics. This is something that's been in the church, the Christian church, long before the, the modern Roman Catholic, uh, whoa, Roman Catholic Empire. So my question is, if this is something that has been instituted by God and is a blessing in the forgiveness of sins, why don't Lutherans like to use it? Are Lutherans allergic to confession and absolution? <laughs> Let's get into it. If you want to understand confession and absolution, you can read about it obviously in the Book of Concord, but in addition to the Book of Concord, it's even in the small catechism if you want to read that, um, which I highly recommend. Uh, in addition to the Book of Concord, this thing actually, it comes from scripture. This is a scriptural ordinance. This is something that God institutes in scripture. Now in multiple places in scripture as well, there's, there's kind of a, there's kind of a, a preface for it, a, a prediction where, where this is something that, this is an authority that I will give to you. This is Matthew, uh, or not, um, yeah, Matthew 16, 18, or, or wherever it is. And Jesus is talking to Peter. Peter says, you know, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and, and Peter says, you are Peter and on this rock, I'll build my church and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I will give you, will, future tense, 
I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And, and he talks about, you know, the binding and the loosing of sins. He might, might talk about the binding and loosing of sins in that passage. Uh, those sins that you forgive will be forgiven in heaven. Uh, and those sins you do not forgive will not be forgiven. Uh, that kind of thing. In my mind, all of these passages about confession and absolution kind of blur together because they're so similar. In John as well, it talks about this. I believe that there's a couple of other passages. Now, initially, Jesus says this to Peter. He says, you know, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And, and then later on, the keys of the kingdom are defined as not, you know, you'll have, you know, permanent papal authority, you and all of your, your descendants, and they will pass down this infallibility and, and the magistrate and all this other stuff that you like kind of want to try to cram into a, into a, into a half a sentence. That's not, the keys of the kingdom is defined as the forgiving and the binding of sins. So two sides of the coin or two sides of the key, you know, it turns to unlock to say you are forgiven, you are absolved of your sins, and then the lock position is you are condemned, you are not forgiven of your sins, uh, you are not repentant, and your sin is clinging to you like like filth on otherwise, well, you're, the rags are filthy, but your sin is clinging to you, and, and you are under church discipline. Sometimes it's called excommunication, church discipline. So this concept of confession and absolution is something that is biblical. Now, specifically how the formula goes, like what you say during it, uh, how the process itself goes, that's not defined in, in the Bible, but the authority given to the disciples. So this is, this, the reason this comes up is, 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 is the reading from, you know, Doubting Thomas or whatever. You've got, the, uh, you've got the room full of disciples and Jesus comes into the room uh, and he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, whoever sins you forgive will be forgiven on, uh, you know, in heaven, and et cetera, et cetera. And he restates the the effect of the office of the keys and he, and he kind of and he gives this to to the disciples and we would argue that this isn't just the apostles who are given the authority to forgive sins but that this is given to those who hold the pastoral office this is those who later on will be defined in the epistles as as elders as presbyteros as uh, uh episcopos as you know as as pastors the pastors have the authority to forgive sins and to bind sins. Now, this can be a scary thing for people who, who are confused about this. Say, well, you know, a pastor shouldn't be able to unilaterally decide whether sins are forgiven or bound. And that's not what's going on. Jesus is calling the pastor to act in his stead. In the same way that baptism and the Lord's Supper is God doing a work and using the pastor to deliver the benefit of that work. Baptism is not the pastor baptizing. Baptism is Jesus baptizing you through the hands of the, ba the, hands of the pastor and through the water. In the same way, confession and absolution is Jesus forgiving you through the words of the pastor. When the pastor says, your sins are forgiven, you can count that as Jesus saying your sins are forgiven. He's just borrowing your pastor's vocal cords. So as, as, as Lutherans, we don't need to be allergic to confession and absolution. This is a biblical practice. In fact, this is something that is very beneficial to us. But why would we need confession and absolution, you might ask? Isn't the whole point of the Reformation that we can just talk to God directly and we don't need a middleman? And, I mean, it's true. You don't need confession and absolution in the, you know, in the, in, in the private sense. You do not need it in the formal sense for the forgiveness of sins. You can pray to God directly. You can say, Our Father who art in heaven, you can pray to God directly for your sins to be forgiven. And they are indeed forgiven. But the benefit of confession and absolution is in the comfort of the forgiveness of sins. Your sins are forgiven if you pray to God, you know, privately, silently, directly. But if you go to the pastor and you say, Pastor, this sin is grieving me. I can't get over this sin that is stuck in my head. I need comfort. And I just continue to feel guilty over this sin. Then the pastor could say, okay, what sin is it? And you explain the sin. That's called confession. You explain your contrition for this. And you say, I am repentant of the sin. I hate that this sin was a part of my life. I am repentant of the sin. And then the pastor says, in the said, by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have now heard with your ear holes, you have heard your sin said out loud. And in response, you have heard God's forgiveness said out loud. Going forward, if you have the temptation, and the devil will do this, he'll try to tempt you to think your sins aren't forgiven. If you have that temptation to think, well, what if my sins weren't really forgiven? What if I wasn't really sincere enough in my repentance? Ah. In the same way that you can point to the date that you were physically baptized and say, I was, my sins were washed away on this date. I became a child of God on this date for sure. 
You can point to the specific date when the pastor forgave your sins and confession and absolution. So that one sin that's going over and over in your head when you're trying to sleep at night, you're saying, I can't believe that I did this horrible, rotten thing. You can remember, you can say, oh yeah, but I confess this and God heard my confession and God pronounced through my pastor the words of absolution. My sin is forgiven. I can now turn over and go to sleep and be comforted. So the benefit of confession and absolution is not that this is necessary. This is the only way that your sins can be forgiven. But that there is comfort in hearing the forgiveness of your sins. And this isn't the same thing as your pastor just proclaiming the general forgiveness of your sins. It's not the same thing as reading scripture and saying, you know, if we say we have no sins, we can we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive all sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not the same as just hearing those words. That is true. You know, you're hearing a factual statement about the forgiveness of God, but this is a direct application of that forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven. You, yes, you, that sin, yes, that sin, you. Your sins are forgiven. It is a different thing than just hearing about the forgiveness of sins in Scripture. It's also a different thing than, you know, praying to God for your forgiveness individually because you have the added comfort of hearing that forgiveness out loud. Now, why, why was this less popular, I suppose, after the, uh, after the whole Lutheran Reformation thing. What, what was the deal? What were they even arguing about if Lutherans and Roman Catholics both have confession and absolution? Well, there's a bunch of, bunch of details. I don't want to minimize them because there's some pretty significant details. For example, Lutherans believe that there's two parts. There's confession and absolution. Uh, Roman Catholics believe that there's three parts. There's confession, absolution, and reconciliation. That's the, uh, the part where, you, where, where your forgiveness is, is, is based on, on on your actions that you do. So you are forgiven by God, but then there's also a requirement that you have to complete in order to receive this forgiveness. Uh, another disagreement that Lutherans and Roman Catholics would have uh, on, the, on this matter is Roman Catholics would say that, that confession and absolution is something that you absolutely positively must go to X number of times a year. At least one time a year, you need to go to confession and absolution. In this case, it's, it's a law. It's a law that you have to obey. Lutherans would say, no, confession and absolution is not a law, but it is a comfort. It is, it is, it is gospel. It is the sweet forgiveness, the, the sweet salve of the forgiveness of your sins. It's not something that you need to bother yourself that, oh, did I go to confession and absolution, you know, 364 days ago? Uh, you know, I, I need to, I need to, you know, get to confession and absolution a certain number of times a, a year, whatever. It's not law, it's, it's gospel. That's one of the distinctions. One of the other distinctions uh, the Roman Catholic Church would, would insist that you would, have to, you would have to list your sins. If you want a confession and absolution, okay, what sins do you want to be absolved of? And go ahead and list them. And this is one of the reasons that Luther spent like nine hours in confession and absolution with his father confessor. To the point where he was told, hey, aren't you being selfish and greedy by taking up so much time to confess your sins? And Luther lamented the fact that by the time he got to the bottom of his list of sins, he had already committed more sins, even by being in confession and absolution. So it was not possible for him to list all of the sins. And again, this, this legalistic twist takes away the comfort of, of the absolution. So the Lutherans would say, no, confession and absolution is a good thing. It is a good thing that should be maintained in the churches, but it should be understand appropriate, uh, understood appropriately as a comfort, as something where you have a sin that's weighing on your heart, you go talk to your pastor, you're absolved of your sin from God himself, now you have that comfort. It's not a law where you have to go a certain number of times a year. It's not a law where you have to list all of your sins and God help you if you forget one, um, or if you talk about some sins and not other sins that you're aware of. It's comfort. It's comfort. That is the point of confession and absolution. Comfort that comes from the explicit statement of the forgiveness of your sins. So should Lutherans be allergic to confession and absolution? No. No, it is a good thing. You should no more despise confession and absolution than you should despise the Lord's Supper or baptism or hearing God's word. It is a gift from God. It is a gift from God that you should receive with joy. So, to those tens of you listening to this, if you've never gone to confession and absolution before, I, I, I would like to challenge you. Reach out to your pastor, contact your pastor and say, dearest pastor of mine, I would like to go through confession and absolution. 
And in the hymnal, there is a section in the Lutheran hymnal, that little, that, uh, what color is it? Sangria. That Sangria hymnal that you have, there is a page, and I forget the page off the top of my head, um, it, near, the, near the beginning, before the hymns begin, it's called Individual Confession and Absolution. Say, Pastor, I would like to go through Individual Confession and Absolution with you. I would like to set up a time to do this. And your pastor will say, well, absolutely. You may even say, wow, nobody's actually asked me to do this before, which hopefully hopefully he's, he's been able to do confession and absolution before because it's a great benefit to you know, be able to bless somebody with something like that. But I, I'm challenging you. Go and ask your pastor. Say, hey, um, Mr. Pastor, would it be possible for us to schedule a time to do confession and absolution? That's private. And the pastor is bound by the seal of confession. So if you've got some egregious sin that you're going to confess to him, he is bound to hold that between himself and God. It's the seal of confession. He's not legally allowed to, you know, tell other people. He's not, he's not allowed to gossip about it. He's not to, you know, tattle on you to other people. But it's for the forgiveness of sins. His job is, is to deliver the forgiveness of your sins. So go ahead. Go ahead and reach out to your pastor and say, I'd like to try out confession and absolution. Then think about any sins. If there's any sin in particular that's bothering you, that's just weighing on your mind more than other sins, go and confess that sin to him. Go and follow the formula. It's really easy to follow. Confess that sin to him. Um, receive the forgiveness for your sins. And see how you feel afterwards. See if you feel better. See if you feel comforted afterwards. And if you don't, then you don't. But now you know how the system works. Now you know how the process works. Give it a shot. It's free, and your pastor will give it to you for free. And it could be a great, wonderful comfort to you. And if you don't use it that often, well, maybe you know somebody else who's struggling with sin who can use it. So hopefully Lutherans stop being allergic to confession and absolution. And give it a shot. Give it a try. In fact, if you can, make it a regular part of your, you know, your, your life. But do it for comfort, not because it's the law. So God bless you and take care.